taking an individual song, what is it and what do you look for? What are the secret ingredients of a song that makes it not only one that you'd take on, um, but something investable? Well, you know, first of all, the data mm. will tell you. I, I know immediately whether or not I right. love the songs, okay. but there's, there's two things that I'm looking mm. for. One is the songs have to have been extraordinarily successful okay. in the first place. Mm-hmm. And the second is the songs have to be of great cultural importance. Mm-hmm. Those two things give you endurance, right? And, and one of the things that really makes songs as an asset class is that the copyright protection is actually very strong. So you've, you've got rule of law protection that gives you 70 years after the death of the last co-composer. Right. So the, you know, we've paid an average of 15 times, just over 15 times, for our catalog, but the average length of earnings in our catalog is 107 years. And, and that 70 years after the death of the last co-composer rule of law is only worth talking about if you're going to buy something that can stand the test of time for yeah. that period, yeah. right? You know, there are other companies out there that are buying catalogs that we just don't believe will, mm. will, will stand the test of time. But when you look at our catalog from you know, Neil Young to Shakira mm-hmm. to Nile Rodgers and Sheik to the Eurythmics to Timbaland, mm-hmm. um, you know, we are, you know, whether it's Lindsey Buckingham and Christine McVie from Fleetwood Mac, these are extraordinarily successful songs, but equally well songs of impo- you know, great cultural importance. Mm. Should we start to see music royalties talked about in the same vein? as a hedge against inflation of like gold and, and similar kind of assets? There's no question. Yeah. Okay. Right? This, is, this is an inflation-proof yeah. asset class mm-hmm. because, as I say, um, it's, you know, if you are, are, are you know, living your best life, mm-hmm. you're doing it to the soundtrack of great songs, yeah. and equally well, if you're in that place where you are looking for comfort, you're doing that with songs. Talk me through the, the economics of, of how it works. So if there's a stream of a song... How does that then generate some revenue for, for you and the fund? There's you know, three different mm-hmm. um, uh, income streams that come with a copyright in a song. The mechanical royalty, which is the royalty that you get when the song is, uh, uh, you know, in old days, produced physically. Mm-hmm. So it's called a mechanical because of the old piano rolls that used to be made to play these songs. But of course, it stayed a mechanical when you started to press vinyl, and it stayed a mechanical when you did CDs, and it stayed a mechanical when you did um, uh, downloads. Mm -hmm. And half of streaming is a mechanical royalty, right? Um, The second royalty is the performance royalty. And this is what you get when the song is publicly performed. And that could be a live performance at the local pub or at the O2 arena. So quite difficult then over the last year. Then. So we've lost about 3% okay. of, of, of our performance income as a result of those shows going away. But now all of those shows are back, back yeah. and you, you can't book a, a venue for 2022 or 2023. Yeah. Yeah. Literally every venue in the world is full. So that's gonna be even bigger than it was previously. But the performance royalty also covers radio play. Mm-hmm and it covers the licenses which also were impacted that allow you to play the songs in a restaurant, in the gym, in uh, uh, retail shops, mm. you know, et cetera. Um, and those sorts of venues pay a monthly licensing fee to the collection society in the mm-hmm. UK, that would be the PRS, yeah. and then they distribute the money to, 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 to the rights owners. Mm-hmm. Those licenses were adversely impacted, of course, when those shops and those mm. gyms were, were, were closed. But now again, those are all back as yeah. well. And then, crucially, the other 50% of streaming is a performance royalty okay. as well. And then the third category is sync, which is what happens when you take the, 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 the song and you marry it to a moving picture. So right. you put it in a movie, you put it in a TV commercial, mm-hmm. you put it in a video game. And that is, is, whereas the other two are royalties, this is a fixed fee mm-hmm. that you get, and that's a negotiated fixed fee. You can get anything from you know, a couple hundred pounds to put the song mm-hmm. you know, in, in a sports match on Sky, on, on a, in a football match on Sky, or equally well, you, if you've got a song that is of great cultural importance yeah. and um, 
uh, you know, you marry it with a luxury product, you know, the biggest fee ever for a sink has been $10 million, to my knowledge, that I've been part of. Wow. What was um, that for? Jimmy that was for Led Zeppelin okay. with uh, 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 a song called Cashmere mm. and uh, uh, Cadillac cars in the Super Bowl in 2003 or so. But the big upside in our business is that, you know, we came to market with the motive of establishing songs as the asset, as an asset class to be reckoned with and making money for our shareholders mm -hmm. and ourselves. But equally well at the same time, we had an ulterior motive and that ulterior motive was to change where the songwriter sits in the economic equation. We're going to change this business and we're going to change it in favor of the songwriter and the songwriter is going to be paid more money. And the beauty of it, of course, is that if the songwriter gets paid more money, then our shareholders make exactly. more money on the catalogs yeah. that we own as well. And there's no reason for it not to happen. Mm. You know, music has gone from in, in this streaming paradigm in the four years that we've been operating, music has gone from being a discretionary or luxury purchase to being a utility. Mm. You know, the, the benchmark for extraordinary success in our business used to be the platinum record, right? right. Use, use the US as a microcosm, that's a million copies in a country that has 360 million people in mm -hmm. it, right? If you think about that for a minute, one in 360 immediately tells you that while the average person might love music, they didn't love it enough to put their hand in their pocket yeah. and pull out a tenor, right? Yeah. Um, now, you know, we have 100 million homes mm. in the United States that have a paid music streaming subscription. So yeah. we've literally gone from our customer being one in 360 to our customer now being one in 3.6. Mm. Was there a point, a real turning point in which you thought, I'm gonna tackle the economics of this and look at the songwriters? It's exactly why I created hypnosis. Yes. You know, I, 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 you know, what I explained about um, why I think that the songwriter is the lone man or woman on the totem pole, mm. you know, that, when I, you know, that's something that I started to think about 10 years ago when I was looking at incredible songwriters like Diane Warren and The Dream and Justin Tranter who were writing these massive pop songs for uh, other artists mm. and those artists were getting incredible benefit relative to what the songwriters were getting. And when I came to the conclusion that the culprits in all of this were, you know, Universal, Warner and Sony, mm. Not the people that work at those companies. There's great people that work at those companies and there's people that do a really good job at developing songwriters, yeah. developing artists, etc. It's the paradigm, you know, it's a paradigm that's existed for more than 75 years. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, when you've got a paradigm that's been around that long, most people are ignorant to the fact that, 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 yeah, that you know, they just see it as normal, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, it's not normal. Right? It's not normal and it's not right, and I'm here to break that paradigm down. But what I knew was that I couldn't fight Universal, Warner, and Sony unless I had real leverage. Yeah. And real leverage is not millions of dollars, which I had. Real leverage is billions of dollars, which I didn't have. Right. Right? So I needed to create something that would give me that billions of dollars of leverage to be able to fight this fight and for them not to be able to squash me like a fly. Right. Um, so, you know, that's, 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 that was the motivation okay. to make this happen. And, and of course, it was just happened to be a perfect construct that, um, uh, you know, acquiring songs, mm. that may seem counterintuitive to some artists, right? Selling their songs. Mm. Um, but, you know, what we've done is we've, we've proven to be a safe pair of hands because you know, my pedigree is, you know, my success and, 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 and reputation have been made with artists and songwriters and mm. producers, not at the expense of them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we acquire these songs and we put them to work mm. to then benefit songwriters because if we can change this paradigm mm. on behalf of the songwriting community, it's the perfect and yeah. to uh, an That's incredible story. What are NFTs and, and why investors are getting excited about them? What is it about them that's... So, you know, obviously there's been a lot of profile about NFTs, mm. you know, non-fungible tokens. Yeah. Um, you know, there have been 
artists that have married music and visuals, created a unique one-off piece of work that people have paid millions of pounds for, mm -hmm. right? And that, of course, uh, created a lot of excitement and you probably had, you know, dozens of artists that thought, I can do this, yeah. I can make millions of pounds as well. Um, but the reality is, is that as with anything that is got this sort of cultural importance of these great songs, you've got to be careful mm. about what you say yes to and what you say no to because, you know, a lifetime's worth of integrity can be blown sure. by doing the wrong thing. Sure. Um, for us, NFTs are going to be a very important part of the future, mm. but we don't think that it's in that category where you create a unique piece of artwork and it sells for, mm. for millions of pounds. That business is already gone. Right? Right. That business came and went in, 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 in the space of a few weeks. Mm. But there is a definitely a mass business where you could be buying anything like you know an, an NFT that is, you know today's version of the tour program right. um, that has songs embedded in it that you know that sells for a price that allows for mass market exploitation of it. Yeah. Um, so there's an income stream to, to, to come from them, but that, that's not really where my focus is. My focus is on the idea of, of NFTs okay. as a you know, container hmm. for the copyright of your song and that blockchain ability to be able to then go out and collect, collect. What's your best story about Noel Rogers? <laughs> um, I mean, there's probably a lot you can choose from, but. Um, you know, Niall and I, uh, you know, this is sort of similar to, to, you know, my relationship with Elton as well when I managed Elton, but it's, it's based on uh, a love of music mm. and it's based on enthusiasm for music. So we start each day talking about music, talking about what we're listening to. Um, you know, our tastes are, are, are varied. So we might be talking about the village people, San Francisco, right. or we might be talking about Eric Dolphy's out to lunch and everything in between. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, we have, I think, an unbelievably successful, you know, artist, manager, partnership, um, because it's based on this love of music and this enthusiasm of music. And, and Niall has this unique quality um, that goes way beyond anything I've ever seen in a human being before, where he only sees the good in something mm. right like what makes him so successful as a songwriter or a collaborator or a producer is that someone can come to him with a song that's you know 90 percent doo-doo and 10 percent great mm. and he only sees the 10 percent right right he doesn't he doesn't waste time or energy on the negative aspect of anything okay. right i've never seen him shout i've never seen yeah. him scream I've never seen him lose his cool. My relationship with Elton, um, you know, I managed the Pet Shop Boys at the same time as I managed Elton, and, and they were all great friends. Mm. And Neil and Chris would call me up once in a while and say, you know, has he thrown an ashtray at you yet? <laughs> and I would say, no, why would he do that? And, and you know, they, they would, you know, kind of, everyone would, would look at the sort of tantrums and tiaras, uh, 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 you know, imagery of Elton. All of which is super exaggerated. Right, of course. Because <laughs> again, Elton and I never ever had a crossword once because it was all based on this incredible enthusiasm of music, mm. incredible enthusiasm for certain records, incredible enthusiasm for the charts. Um, and I'm just really blessed. You know, I, I can't play the guitar, I can't sing a song, I can't write a song. Um, the only thing that gives me a seat at the table with someone like Niall is that I take my responsibility really seriously. Mm. And I make sure that I deliver because otherwise there wouldn't be any reason to have me around. But thank you.